How many of you have your Bible? If you have your Bible, why don't you lift it up in the air? So what's the name of the conference? There's got to be more Bibles up there. Got to have more Bibles. Got to bring your Bible to church. So important. It's the textbook for church. Textbook for life, really. So in your Bibles, if you'd open up to Matthew chapter 7. I don't normally change scriptures or sermons or Bible studies after I think the Lord has given me one. But this was one of those rare occurrences and even with Pastor Ken's message to see the Holy Spirit continuing to lead in the proper direction. At first I thought I was going to share another Bible study on 2 Timothy 2. And for the church leaders here, I encourage you to read 2 Timothy chapter 2. If you're frustrated in the ministry, perhaps you're striving too much and you're not concerned enough about sanctification. 2 Timothy 2 says to be concerned about sanctification more than about our own striving. But here in Matthew 7, I think it would be so great and important for us to realize it is not just about hearing the word of God. And as Pastor Josh mentioned, we have been blessed. We have been borderline spoiled with how much good teaching we've received. However, if we do not apply it, it is a waste in our life and it is a higher judgment that we will receive later on because we know what we ought to do Uh, so let's just go ahead and pray and then we'll dive in here lord we thank you we thank you for your word your goodness lord just the family that you've brought us into Uh, lord thank you for allowing me to be adopted into this family lord and lord for each and every one of us who you've brought here i just pray lord there'd be a greater depth of gratitude and humility for what you've done for us and that we would be those living sacrifices God holy and acceptable in your sight so Lord strengthen us fill us Lord Holy Spirit help us to be doers of your word and not hearers only Lord it's in your name that we pray amen our text is in Matthew 7 verse 24 Jesus says therefore Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it fell, and great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. And we're blessed. We're blessed in this conference. And I'm blessed that so many of you have built your life upon the rock many of you you've built your life on the firm foundation that is Jesus Christ and the word of God and your homes you've survived even though you've gone through the harshest of storms the harshest of storms that life can offer whether it's death in the family whether it's sexual abuse whether it's bankruptcy whether it is complete injustice and yet you are here still standing as a token of God's grace his mercy, and his love. But there are some of us here that our houses have not fared so well. Storms come, and even small storms come. Maybe in the cafe they got your coffee wrong, right? And to you, that was a huge storm. You blew up, you exploded, you started yelling, and your house fell after a tiny little raindrop. And I hope as a result of this, we would say, Lord, as a result of today, I want to begin to dig deep. As a result of this conference, I don't want to just be a hearer of God's word. I desire to be a doer of God's word. In 1 Peter 2, verse 4, it tells us, coming to him as to a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. You also as living stones 
are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. So important for us to believe on Jesus Christ, feelings or not, because feelings come and go, but faith in the Lord Jesus. In Luke, 40, in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Jesus asks a question. And it's such a simple question. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I will show you whom he's like. This is Luke's account of the same story that Jesus gives. And Jesus begins this same story and analogy saying, why do you call me Lord and Master and yet you do not obey my word? And some of the men here, I'm sure you've been on the receiving end of a conversation that goes like this. You say that you love me, but you never do fill in the blank. I don't know if you Kenyan men get in trouble for leaving the toilet seat down and just doing certain things in the bathroom, right? If you really love me, you would take into account your wife. Jesus here, he has a similar warning. Just because you label yourself as a Christian, just because you label yourself as a pastor, does not mean that you are a Christian or a pastor, just because you declare that you're going to heaven scripturally does not mean that you are actually going to heaven. Just because you're at a Bi Love the Bible conference does not mean that you actually love the Bible or that you're destined to heaven after this. John Trapp, he has this quote. I believe it's a powerful quote. He says, there are those that speak like angels and yet they live like devils. They have Jacob's smooth tongue and yet they have Esau's rough tongue hands it's not our words that save us yes we have to with our tongue confess he is lord but we must believe in our hearts first john 3 7 john says little children let no one deceive you even our own wicked hearts he who practices righteousness is righteous just as he speaking of jesus is righteous it's not about what we say it's not even about our religious attendance it's about what we practice and to who we obey. What are we building up for the kingdom of heaven and what are we building our life upon? I asked Josh earlier, but how many of you are familiar with or have a bank account? Anybody here have a bank account? A few of you, you could give me your numbers afterwards, that'd be great. But a question for you. Will my bank account change if I just declare I am wealthy, I am wealthy, I am wealthy? Will my bank account change at all? It has no effect on it. Will my bank account change if I attend my bank branch more often? If I start going to the bank once a week? In America, bank branches, they have little free coffee stations and different things like that. If I begin to learn every bank teller's name, if I know the manager's name, if I know everyone at the bank, will that increase or subtract my bank account? Not at all. What will change my bank account is what's done outside of the bank. And it's the same with us here. What affects our lives, what will reveal if we truly are God's sons and daughters, is not necessarily just what we do at church, but it's how we live outside of church. How we live in our homes, how we live in the day-to-day. In James chapter 2, verse 19, he says, You believe there is one God and you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Even the demons, they believe and they show emotion. They show emotion, they show feeling, but they're not saved. So I love Jesus' simple question. Why? Why would you do this? Why would you call me Lord and Master and Savior and not do the things which I say? If you truly believe I died for you, if you truly believed I love you, why would you not be obedient to what I tell you in Scripture? In, James, in Romans chapter 6, 16, he says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves? 
whether of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience leading to righteousness. Friend, who do you obey? On a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, who are you obeying? Is it those chains of gossip? Is it those chains of pornography? Is it those chains of drunkenness? Or are you compelled and stirred to be moved to obey God's word and to be about our Father's business? Uh, there's this story about Alexander the Great, the greatest general many believe that has ever existed. And he came to this battalion and he met one soldier who was a coward and ran away from the fight. And Alexander the Great asked this young soldier, he says, soldier, what's your name? You know what the name of the soldier was? Alexander. And Alexander the Great, he tells him, then either change your name or change your conduct. Change your name or change your conduct. And many of us have been hurt by the conduct of so-called Christians. And it would be far greater if they would either change their name or change their conduct. And Jesus, as we've said over and over again, the heart and desire of Christ is that you would repent, is that we would change our conduct. And the only way we can do that is to come to the end of ourselves and ask the Lord to change us and then walk in the truth of the word of God if he truly is the way, the truth, and the life, why wouldn't we obey him? How foolish to not obey him. Romans chapter 2, verse 13, it says, It's not the hearers of the law that are just in the sight of God, but it is the doers of the law that will be justified. Hearing and doing means that we obey God. And the way God speaks to us is through the word of God. This is how he speaks to us. In Luke eleven twenty eight, 28, Jesus tells us, it's more blessed, it, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. In James 1, 22, he says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. That's the dangerous thing about these conferences is that you can come and go and deceive yourself thinking that you're better or you're more faithful or that you're going to love the Lord more just because you've simply attended. We must obey God's word. Back to the analogy that Jesus gives, he says he's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose and the stream beat vehemently against that house and could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. I asked a fellow Kenyan, I asked, is it easy to dig in Kenya? What do you say? No, it's not easy here. Anybody want to go and have a ditch digging party after this? It's difficult. It's sweaty. It is exhausting. It is hard work. In Miami, where I'm from, you get six inches of easy digging, and after that, it's coral rock because we are at sea level. Digging is not easy work, but if we want to have a house that will withstand every storm that comes, it takes hard work, and we need to dig deep into the foundation of Jesus Christ. And even though it's difficult, even though it takes time, even though it may take some sweat and hard work, I encourage you to begin doing it today. Begin obeying God's word from here on out. Repent and continue to follow him. In Ephesians 2.20, it tells us Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. If there's a man in scripture who went through many storms, I believe it's David. David went through many storms in this life. I don't know if many of you have had your wife taken away from you and given to another man by your own father-in-law. Pretty difficult. I don't know how many of you have had your own father-in-law chasing you and hunting you down with the special forces of the nation. David lived through this. And yet David says, the Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. David says, who is God except the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? The Lord lives. Blessed be my rock. And let God be exalted, the rock of my salvation. 2 Samuel 22, verse 
verse 2, verse 32, and verse 47. The Apostle John, he says in 1 John 2, 17, this world is passing away and the lusts of it, but he who does the will of God abides forever. One last scripture on Christ being our cornerstone. It's 2 Timothy 2, 19. He says, nevertheless, the the solid foundation of God stands. Having this seal, the Lord knows those who are his, And let everyone who names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. If you say you're going to heaven, your role is to depart from iniquity. Not to embrace it, not to walk a gray line, but to run from it, to depart from it. Jesus is the only true eternal rock and fortress. And compared to him, every other foundation is sinking sand. Just as Travis told us yesterday, the gospel is the one and only and true gospel. And he is the only foundation that will get us through every storm in this life and the final storm which leads us into the next life. I think there's three pillars that are greatly lacking within the homes that each of us built. Whether you're a new believer, a pastor, a church leader, or just a servant at church, Three pillars that are lacking within our quote-unquote Christian homes. Number one is biblical and loving confrontation. Biblical and loving confrontation. Number two is biblical and loving forgiveness. Biblical and loving forgiveness. And number three is biblical and loving church attendance. Three things that are lacking within our Christian homes. In Matthew 18, verse 15, how should we handle biblical confrontation? Posting about it on Facebook? This person hurt me, this person harmed me? No, Jesus says, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he hears you, you've gained your brother. If he doesn't hear you, you come with another witness. If he still doesn't hear you or she doesn't hear you, then you come with another witness and a church leader, a church pastor. But many Christians, do we obey Matthew 18? It's much easier to gossip or to complain or to find our own group that agrees with us and our harm than to be biblical and loving in our confrontation. The second one, which is even more difficult, is biblical and loving forgiveness. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31 and 32, Paul tells us, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ has forgiven you. How much has Christ forgiven you of? Everything, all of our sins. So how much ought we to forgive one another with everything? Anything they do to us, it doesn't mean you have to be their best friend. It doesn't mean you need to continue walking in life with them, but it is far greater to forgive and let go of that bitterness and wrath and anger than to hold on to it and cling to it. And it's so sad because even pastors struggle with this. Not at this conference, but I'll be at another conference. And when the pastors get together, all they can talk about is all the people that have hurt them. And they haven't forgiven them. And you have a pastor maybe even teaching this text. And then in the back, instead of seeking that person, confronting them, and then forgiving them, they are not being biblical or loving. The final one, I don't know if this is as bad in Kenya as it is in America. In America, it's absolutely terrible. But Hebrews Chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. It says, let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some. But exhorting, building up one another. That was that word we used with Peter. Calling one another to our side to encourage them and walk together. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. I don't know what your church attendance is like. 
It doesn't matter what's going on in the world. We need to attend church and true church. Not just somebody's living room. That might be the beginning of a church, but it's not a church just yet. In Florida, people say, oh, I'm going to go fishing on my boat, and that's my church. Doesn't count as church. Has to be biblical. But these things are lacking within our homes after we've built upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. The book of Proverbs has a lot to say on those who build up their homes and those who destroy their own homes. In Proverbs 24, verse 3 through 4, it says, Through wisdom a house is built, and by understanding it is established. By knowledge the rooms are filled with all precious and pleasant riches. Many of you, you're, you're Bible teachers, right? You're pastors. Where does wisdom come from? Scripture. Where does true knowledge come from? Scripture. Where does understanding come from? Scripture. Jesus is the truth. So the question for us today is, are we building our homes? Or are we the very hands that are destroying our own homes and our own churches? Are we spending time alone in God's word to increase in wisdom, in understanding, and in knowledge? The fear of the Lord, that is the beginning of wisdom. Are we spending time working in this? Or men, are you simply, as Pastor Ken said, are you the poster boy for foolishness, immaturity, laziness, stupidity, and wastefulness? Men, are we spending time seeking to grow in wisdom and knowledge and discernment to not only build our own homes, but to build the homes of those lesser than us, weaker than us, and to build the homes of the church? And if there's one tool I've seen destroy or build people, it's the power of the tongue. In the power of our tongue, we have the ability to build up someone or to completely destroy someone and all of you husbands, you know this. When your wife asks you, how do I look today? You realize you wield that power. That power to destroy or that power to build up. In Proverbs 14.3, it says, In the mouth of a fool is a rod of pride, but the lips of the wise will preserve them. How, how do you speak of yourself? Is it always prideful? Always how great you are that you deserve a certain title on your name tag or something different like that? Or are you willing to take the lower seat? Proverbs 18, verse 6 through 7, it says, A fool's lips enter into contention, and his mouth calls for blows. A fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. Are you constantly entering into arguments? Are you looking for contention? It says you are acting like a fool. You're destroying your own home. But then in Proverbs 12, 18, it tells us that there is one who speaks like the piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise promotes health. The tongue of the wise man, it promotes health. It, it builds up one another. It is that sweet honey that strengthens that brother or that sister that is hurting. And men, our pride quickly leads us into contention and destruction. Just as Pastor Ken exhorted us, are we using our tongue within our own home to build up our wife and our children and those around us? I don't know if you Kenyans are like Miamians, but Miamians, they are very good at sarcasm. We just make fun of each other all the time. Someone from Miami, if they love you, they'll take your greatest insecurity. Let's say you have a huge forehead, and they'll literally call you, hey, forehead, how you doing? They will become your nickname. If you're chubby and overweight, they say, hey, gordo, that means, hey, fatty, how you doing? How's your day going? And we easily cut one another down. In our flesh, it is so easy, it is so fun to cut down one another. Hopefully you don't call your wife anything like that unless that's the culture and that's a blessing to call your wife that. But we need to realize the way we treat our wife, men, it's going to lead to our own future. In Ephesians chapter 5, let's turn there. So important for us to turn there. Ephesians chapter 5.
verse 28. And we don't, we don't have time to go here, but in Paul's letters to Timothy and Titus, he says, if you want to be an elder, you have to have your own house in order. Because if you don't have your own house in order, why in the world should you be making decisions on God's house and on God's flock? So this is great questions for us, great questions for me. Ephesians 5, 28, it says, Husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Brothers, are we nourishing and cherishing our wives? If we asked all the wives here, hey, how does your husband treat you? Would they speak of blessing and nourishment? Or would she have something else to say? In Ephesians chapter 5, earlier in that same chapter, verses 3 through 4, it tells us, But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. Here Paul, he's not even addressing church leadership. This is for every believer here. Fornication, all uncleanness, covetousness, it shouldn't even be named among us. And it's so sad how it's rampant within our churches, rampant within the churches here in Kenya, rampant within the churches in America. It's so sad. But is our speech fitting of a saint? I encourage you, whatever your cultural norms are, don't allow that to be the foundation and the bar which you mark your own speech or actions or love or work habits. Allow scripture to be the bar that you measure your life upon. I love this scripture, Luke 6.31, it says, Just as you want men to do to you, you also do to them likewise. As you want people to treat you, that's how you ought to be treating one another. So are we living as a saint or are we living as a fool? Who are you this morning? Are you building up your house, building up your church, building up the foundation of your life? Or are you the culprit of destroying it brick by brick? In Proverbs 14, 16, it says, A wise man fears and departs from evil, but a fool rages and is self-confident. Our confidence must come from the Lord. We can't trust in our own heart. Our heart is foolish, it is wicked, and it deceives us. That's why we must come to the mirror of the word of God and say, Lord, who am I? Lord, what does your scripture have to say about my actions? about the way I treat one another. We come back to our text, verse 49. He says, He who heard and did nothing is like a man who built his house on the earth without a foundation, against which the stream beat vehemently, and immediately it fell, and the ruin of that house was great. And family, friend, the storms of life will come. No matter who your master is, if your master is Jesus Christ, if your master is money, if your master is alcohol or power or the applause of people, the storms of life will come. That rain will descend. The floods will come and the wind will blow and beat against your house. But the question is, will you still be standing? Will you st still be standing? And it's all dependent upon what our homes and what our lives are built upon. And the interesting thing about this text is Jesus says the only difference between these two homes is the foundation. On the outside, the homes may look exactly the same. They may have the same siding, the same roof, the same paint, but the only difference is the foundation. Hey, According to scripture, one might even be beachfront property built on the sand. One might even look prettier and nicer than the other. But that hidden part, 
That part that is done in the secret place is what will determine if you will stand or if you will fall when the storms of life come. The storms of life, they shake us to our core. And on the outside, you may look spiritual, but when the storms arise, it will reveal who you truly are. It's been said, Christians are like tea bags. You find out who they are when they're dunked in hot water. When you're sitting in hot water, we see what you're made of. We see what you're really made of. Bankruptcy, cancer, death. What is your response? Are we like Job able to say he gives, he takes away? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Though he slay me, I will trust in him. David Guzik, I understand he's coming soon, a great teacher. He says, it's better that we test the foundation of our life now rather than later on. At the judgment before God when it is too late to change our destiny. You see, that's the blessing of hearing a message like this. If you realize your life's not built on the foundation, you could change it now and you could still enter into heaven. If you're unwilling to change it, by the judgment seat, you're going to have no chance to change that foundation or change where you will end the rest of eternity. Proverbs 10, 25, when the whirlwind passes by, the wicked is no more, but the righteous has an everlasting foundation. What joy we have as believers. Our foundation, our rock, there is no rock like our rock. There is no God like our God. What a blessing we have that our God will get us through every storm of life. And there is the greatest storm that every single human being will go through. Every single one of us. Maybe you haven't gone through death. Maybe you haven't gone through injustice. Maybe you haven't gone through bankruptcy. But every single human being, except two, will go through that great storm of death. And unbelievers, they don't know how to handle it. They, they, they're scared of it. Even Christians, they, they fear at it. They're, they're shaken by this. My family has recently gone through the great storm of death. You see, back in February, my mom passed from this life into the next. And though it was difficult for us as children, the, the one that my heart truly broke for was my father. Because similar as the testimony this morning, my dad and mom were together for 58 years. They were married for 45 years. That's his best friend. That's the only person besides the Lord that knows him to his core. And he went through and saw my mom go through the greatest storm of life. And I found much comfort in the scriptures, but I found much comfort in the second highest selling book ever, which is Pilgrim's Progress. I encourage you, if you've never read it, try to get your hands on a copy of it. But Pilgrim's Progress calls it the great river of death. And it's the only way we can enter the celestial city. It's the only way we can enter our homeland, the nation whose builder and maker is God. It's the only way we'll be able to see the lover of our soul. It's the only way we will be able to see our king, our Lord, our master. Within this book, the two characters are named Christian and Hopeful. And they've gone through the journeys of life, the highs and the lows, the temptations, the weights, the burdens. And yet these two friends encourage one another to the very time they come to the great gates of the celestial city. The only problem is that this great city whose government will finally be perfect, no more taxes. What a joy, right? Perfect health care, perfect life. This city that will have no more tears, this city that will have no more pain or no more injustice, this city that also allows us friendship with the king. The only way to get through this city is through the great river of death. It tells us between them and the gate was a river, but there was no bridge to go over and the river was very deep. 
And at the sight of this river, the pilgrims were stunned. But they were told by two men, two shining men, two angels on the other side, you must go through the river or you cannot come to the gates of the city. The pilgrims began to ask, is there any other way to the gate? Is there any other way to the celestial city? And they were told only two have gone the other way. Enoch and Elijah have been permitted a different path since the foundation of the world. And when the last trumpet sounds, they will also get a different way to that great celestial city. The pilgrims, realizing this truth, begin to be anxious. They begin to be fearful. They look this way, they look that way, and there's no other crossing. There's no ladders, there's no land cruisers, there's no other way to get to the other side of the river. So then they ask these two celestial beings, how deep are the waters? Are the waters the same depth the whole way across? And they said, no. They said, you will find the river deeper or shallower as you believe in the king of the city. And as we go through the river of death, that final storm, it will be easier or it will be more difficult depending on your faith in the king. If your faith is strong in the king, if you trust in him, it is a great victory. As Paul would say, he's about to depart on his cruise. Or if you don't have faith in the Lord, it will be the scariest storm you will ever begin to go through. They begin entering the river and Christian begins to sink like a rock. He begins to cry, I sink in the deep waters and the billows go over my head. All of his waves go over me. The sorrows of death have come past me. I will not see the land which flows with milk and honey. But thankfully, He had a great friend named Hopeful, and he tells him, be of good cheer, my brother. I feel the bottom, and it is good. These troubles and these distresses that you go through in these waters are no sign that God has forsaken you, but they are sent to try you, whether you will call to mind that which you've received of his goodness and live upon him in your distresses. Christian was thought for a while and to whom also hopeful added these words, Christian, be of good cheer. Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Finally, Christian with faith, he broke out with a loud voice and he said, oh, I see him again. And he tells me, when thou passest through these waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. So friend, I ask you, What is your life built upon? Will you be able to feel that firm foundation even when you go through the great river of death? What's that foundation? It's Jesus Christ that we can get through the strong and most difficult storm that life has to offer, death itself. And we could say, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? Sin and death, they're nothing compared to Jesus Christ. He has crushed the head of Satan, the head of sin, and the head of death. I encourage you to build your house upon the rock and to allow Christ to build your home. In Psalm 127, verse 1, it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. Allow the Lord to build your home. Allow the Lord to build his church because guess what? It's his church. It's not your church. And if you're striving and striving, it will avail to nothing. One last scripture here. We could turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians 3, verse 9 through 10, it says, For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. 
according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder, I've laid the foundation and another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. And that's my exhortation to you this afternoon, that you would take heed how you build upon the foundation. That number one, your foundation would be in Jesus Christ, but then after that, you'd be paying attention to how you're building upon our cornerstone, upon Jesus Christ. May we be not only hearers of the word, may we be doers of his word. May we stop just saying, Lord, Lord, with lip service and hot air, but may we be those who name the name of Christ and depart from iniquity. May we live biblical lives in every aspect of our life, in our confrontation, in our forgiveness, in our churches. May they be biblical. In our marriages, in our private life, in our purity, may they be biblical. May our speech not be praising God and singing at one moment and then cursing others the very next moment. May our speech be fitting of a saint. May we be known as those Barnabases around us encouraging one another and building one another up. May we take the time and the energy to dig deep to take time to put in the hard work and effort to build upon our lives upon Jesus Christ. Because when the storms of life come, you'll be able to survive and your house will still be standing and your life and your families will still be standing. And what a great joy we have to not only have Christ, but to be able to withstand the storms of this life and the storm that enters into the next. So Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you give us this blessing and this opportunity, Lord, to build our lives upon the rock. And again, Lord, as the theme of our conference has been loving your word and changing Africa, Lord, may there be repentance. May our hearts change. If we're realizing that much of our life is unbiblical, Lord, would you change us? Would you work in us, Lord? May we truly repent And Lord, for those here who have been through storms and perhaps they haven't been able to forgive, perhaps they haven't been able to confront, Lord, I pray that they'd pray with someone, Lord, that they'd be honest with someone and that they would ask you, Lord, for help to forgive one another and to confront those that must be confronted. Lord, we thank you for your goodness, your grace. Thank you that there is no rock like you, Lord. We love you. We thank you, Jesus. It is in your great and mighty name we pray. Amen.